So today, I've come dead baiting. It's one of my favorite methods. That's the same as every other method, because I love them all. <laughs> and I've come to uh, my local reservoir, which I've, I've fished on and off over the years. And um, when I turned up today, it was perfect conditions for trying to find the fish because it's always hard on a big, big bowl like this. It's, it's quite a featureless venue to look at to actually find out where those fish are. And one of the biggest things to do, and especially at this time of year, is to find out where those bait fish are. So I've only had the rods in half an hour, 45 minutes, because I took that long walking around with binoculars. It was a bit wet, a bit drizzly this morning, but what I did see when I got to this part of the, uh, the reservoir was I saw some cormorants. Now, a lot of anglers aren't very keen on cormorants. They're not my favorite bird, but they are a lot better at finding fish than I am. So I actually can use them um, and because they can tell me that you can see probably, I don't know if you can in the camera, but there's just one out there on the buoy now. So uh, they were diving. So I know they're there for a reason. They're there for fish. Um, and, and ultimately they're there for, you know, bite-sized fish, which again is pike-sized fish. And that's what I'm here to fish for today. So, you know, there was also a couple of grebes out there as well. So I know there's silver fish in the area. So um, that's as, as good a place as any for me to start. So um, that's where I've uh, camped up today. I've got three rods out there with different baits on and at different ranges and um, I'm just now waiting for the uh, scent to kind of leak out of those dead baits and a few other little tricks and bits and pieces I do and hopefully we'll be able to show you a fish or two and I'll be able to show you a few of the edges I do which definitely help me pike fishing and definitely on bigger reservoirs so fingers crossed let's see how we get on. Now um, I'm just going to run you through the terminal tackle which I use. So the terminal tackle is the last bit, the end tackle. Maybe the most important tackle, but it all is important because it all has to be balanced and it all works together. So if you're using strong rods and strong braid, you need strong terminal tackle because ultimately you're going to, you could potentially lose fish and um, you're using that strong tackle for a reason because of the weed beds, because you are using strong tackle, you don't want to snap up. So. We start with the trace. Here, as you can see, it's about between 12 and 18 inches, and that's 40 pound. Okay, so it's 18 kilogram, and that's the fox predator wire. I use it, I've got the 49 strand on there. They do it in 26 pound, like that one. And we've got 40 pounds. Bit more finesse, maybe with the lighter. When you notice snags, fishing for potentially bigger fish, up to the 40. I tend to use 40 for an awful lot of my fishing just because I know I've got that extra strength. It's pretty kink resistant as well. Whenever you cut this 49 strand, it's very, very, very important to actually get a lighter and you light it until you just see it change color and it goes red. That's where you cut it. If you don't cut it there, and you just try and cut it anywhere, it will fray. That's not a design fault or anything like that. That's how it actually works. And what it does is it, 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 it concretes it where you light it and it makes a nice clean cut, which then enables you to be able to thread on the crimp. That's really important. I crimp it. You got your crimps. It already comes with a little box of crimps. The, the wire does. And then it's just a simple case of looping it through into the in between the teeth and a nice steady firm you can squeeze as hard as you can you won't cut through you won't break it but what you need to do afterwards is test it very carefully and give it a really nice pull but do be careful and always leave oh, just under a centimeter maybe just just to allow for that margin of slippage in the, in the worst scenario if you cut it off too close it could slip and go at least you've got a little bit of give there if it did under extreme pressure need to slip slightly the next one I wrap round like a like a uh, like a hair knot. Wrap it round and then loop it through the top of the eye. And then with that, I just put a little treble cover on the top as well. And then that just stops it from unraveling and keeps it really, really, really tight. And then up to there, I come up to a trace cover. Again, it's crimped to the swivel to one of our diamond swivels underneath there. 
and then that just pushes over. And what that does is that keeps it, it kicks it away a little bit. As it comes down, it does push it out and kick it away rather than letting it drop. It will, it will kick it away and it just keeps it a bit tidier as well and, and keeps it more in line. And then we go on to a swivel. When you get to the swivel, I use these. These are great. Okay, these are quick link change uh, swivels. And what they've got there, they've got a little slip on there. And you get the swivel eye, and you on one of these, you loop it around, and you can, in a second, just loop it and take it off. However, it won't come off when you're doing normal fishing. So it will stay in there. And, and But for, when you get a fish in the net, you can just quickly undo it. Put your rod down, put the lead down, which is connected. And I think you've just got the fish, which has got the trace on. And you can carry it up to your mat. Otherwise, you've got to carry the rod, you've got to carry everything. It'd be very cumbersome. Um, and, and also, you could potentially trip and all those other hazards. So quickly undo that, leave the rod safely, look after the fish, take it to where your mat is. So they're really, really good. I've started using those a few years ago. They're great. Um, and then I would go on to, uh, on to run rings. And... Um, and you need minimal resistance really so what we do is we sell these in selection packs i mean here you've got the buffer beads and then you've got a little run ring there but a little quick link on there that would run up your main line run down to a buffer bead so it buffers up against the buffer bead to stop it hitting into your knot and to that i use heavy leads so here I mean, this one here is four and a quarter, and this one here, is six ounce. That might sound like a really, really, really heavy lead. I've got heavy, heavy gear. Um, most of the time, I'm using fours. I happen to have sixes in the box due to the fact that bad weather conditions, I need to anchor it down. So what I do is I keep it anchored with a heavy lead, because when I get a take, I want the lead to stay in position, and I want the drop-off indicator to drop and then the fish can take that freely without knowing there's any resistance. And that is an anchor, it's staying there as an anchor. I've got heavy gear, I've got heavy rods, so the, the rod can easily cope with leads of this sort of size. And then what I do, it's not what everyone does, but what I personally do is I actually put an up trace on because I quite often put out chopped fish and chopped pellet and things like this. And when I do, I use this fluorocarbon here. It's 60 pound, it's really, really thick, um, but I use it um, so that up and down there, on the run ring runs my lead and it just means it protects in case a pike was to brush its teeth against it, pick up any chopped fish anywhere near or anything like that. It gives me a lot more protection than braid would because braid can be very, very delicate. So that's pretty much my terminal setup and that's what I use. This is one of those ones where I'm fishing a weedy venue I gave it a few pulls and a few twitches. As I put it in, it clipped out. Picked up the rod. Didn't feel like anything there at all. Gave it a few twitches, nothing. Put it back in again. Just as I said it, it clipped out again. Definitely was a fish. But unfortunately, sometimes in the autumn when there's still a lot of weed about, you don't know whether you're bringing in a fish or weed because as soon as a fish gets weed over its, uh, over its face, most fish, pike, carp, most fish really, they, whether they calm or not, I don't know, but it certainly stops them from fighting because they can't really see what's going on. So at the moment, I'm just bringing in a lump. <laughs> could be a hundred pound pike, which no one knows about, or it could just be a lump of weed. So um, we will see in a moment. If it is weed, it's a big lump of weed. <laughs> and you can probably see how much pressure I'm putting on this, and it's a lot. And I can only do that with strong tackle. This is a Predator, three and a quarter pound test curve rod, 50 pound braid. I think I can see a very small pike, but a lot of weed. Just gently step over this one here. Pull it across the top of that other rod there. And down there is what we call in the business a micro pike. <laughs> and that'll probably be why. There we go, look in now, and if you can see, that is a micro pike. But it's a pike on a day where we're very thankful to, uh, to get a take. 
and he was probably sat there watching. Be very careful putting your hands in because you know there's trebles in there. You've got to remember I've done this a thousand times. It doesn't make it any easier, so you do have to be very, very careful. And now we can see there, there's, um, there's a little micro pike, very pretty little micro pike. <laughs> He's still saying, oh look, I'll have a piece of your lamprey. So I'll, uh, I'll quickly unhook that one. We'll have a little look at it. And then we'll get that bait back out there again and see if we can catch his mum. <laughs> Fingers crossed for a bigger one because they can't get any smaller. Well, that's perfection in miniature. I don't think no matter how much I hold this out, <laughs> he's ever going to look anything different from, um, from small. But who cares when they're that beautiful? Absolutely thin, perfect. I mean, look at the markings on the back of that. Absolutely stunning little fish. You can see where they're the ultimate predator, which hasn't changed for many, many, many years for a very good reason. Tell your mum, Ben's in town. Let's let her go. <laughs> So, now we're looking at this type of thing here. This is a bluey, dead bait. I've been using that today. It's a big bait hole, can be used hole, but I use them in, uh, in half sections, so I cut across the middle down here. And I've been popping them up just because it's still autumn, there's a lot of weed out there. If there isn't any weed, I quite often put them on the bottom, but there is a lot of weed, so I've been popping those, those ones up. And then lamprey, very well known, as you can see, very bloody. And I've been doing something a little bit different now. I've been popping them up, but I've actually been popping these ones up with air. And I've been popping these ones up with a poly ball for two reasons. One, this will hold air inside of it once I trap it at one end, and this one won't. So the option I've got there is to actually, um, is to use poly balls. And I'll show you how I do that. So I've got my lamprey, I've cut it in half. You can use them whole and inject them, absolutely fine. You're gonna use a bit of a smaller bait, which I use for popping up. Then we start wrapping around and around and around and around and around with bait elastic. Till we get it nice and tight. You wanna get as tight as you can without snapping it. Just letting it thread through your fingers. And Keep going, keep going. You can see now that's really tight. And I'm pulling it really tight. And if it snaps, that's fine because that's tight enough. You can see how tight that is and how much that's tying that in. So now I've wrapped up the lamprey, so I've sealed it. Now what I'm going to do is put some air in it. So we sell these in the Predator range and it's the oil and air kits. What you need is you need the finest needle. If you use the bigger needles, which are for oil, the air will just come straight out. They're not as effective at all, okay? And you, and you need the, this size syringe as well. Take it all the way back. It's absolutely vital you're using a syringe and you're using air. If you were to accidentally get this into your hand, you can get, obviously, air going into your bloodstream, which can be, it can be absolutely fatal if it gets into the wrong organ. So you need to be very careful. So don't hold the bait like this and think, oh, it's okay. I, I can just hold it in my hand and it'll be fine. You might feel confident with it, you might feel confident holding it, but what's to say a friend doesn't come over and tap you on the shoulder or something falls down on top of you if it's windy or there's a million and one things which could happen. So just take that process out. Don't even think about holding it in your hand. Have it down on, a, on, on something which if you were to slip or anything like this, it's concrete behind it. It isn't going to be any damage to yourself. Now what you do, use head or tail sections, is just get that inside and then just press that syringe night see, I don't know if you can see that, I'm sure you can because it's pretty obvious what happened there, just, I always rub my finger over it when I'm done, but you went from something which was floppy and looking, I mean look, it, it basically stands up, there's that much air in it. That will go all day without letting any, without sinking at all. That will absolutely stay popped up all day. So it's a really, really, really good little tip for popping up lamprey naturally. 
Um, when you do it in the head, you can probably see there's a little bit of blood coming out there. When you actually uh, uh, do it in the head section, you'll have blood just oozing out as well. So they're probably my preferred section for doing the head for it. So there's a good little tip there. Popping up lamprey, which is always a good bait. Injecting it with the air. Wrapping it up with some, uh, it's usually sea anglers use that for wrapping up their baits. Wrapping it down the end. And away you go. One popped up lamprey. Ready? Okay, now we got bluey. Bluey. That would be a bite then. There it goes. Okay, so drag's perfect. Make sure it's behind the ring. There it goes, it's running. So Oh no, pulled out of it. Can I pull out of it? Did I? No, pulled out of that one. Good take as well, it was really running with that. Damn. Damn. Just into weed now. Damn, I shouldn't have lost that. Yeah, just into weed. Okay, so here we've got bluey section, half a bluey section. You can use a whole one if you want to. It's a big bait, but you could do. It's not that big for a big pipe, but I use half. Smaller baits catch you quite often, smaller fish and big fish. So here I've got the head section. I don't know if you can see there, but, ugh, a lot of blood coming out there. And that's what the pike is, um, is picking up on, picking up on that blood scent in the water. So what we're going to do, simply put that in there. Nice bit of flesh there. Put that one in the side up there. And we've got a nice sized bait. And then simply here, got some rigging wire there. I put that through the eye. Put it down to about there so it's going to be sticking up. Now, what I would do is then wrap that around and twiddle it down the trace there so it's not going to come off, it can't get caught up in the pike or anything like that. Now when you get a, a bite, those hooks quite simply come out when you're playing the fish and you'll have, uh, you'll have that trace securely wrapped round and round and round there. The best thing to do is find out where you're going to have it, find out where that poly ball is going to be and then lock it into place because it's very fiddly to try and do it while it's actually in situ on the fish. So you pull it out, that's how long my trace is going to be and then just literally wrap it around in between the two, around the eye and in between the two traces there and it gives you a nice stiff boom and it also means that that's going to stay on there and keep that nice and popped up off the bottom. That's a good way of doing a bait which is a bit different. Like I said earlier you can then twitch it back, lower it down and doing those little tactics with it. So I just had this one, pull out the clip, a couple of beeps, picking up the rod, just feeling that braid in between my fingers. If it was to take off at 200 miles an hour, I let go, and it's all gone. It's not going to hurt or damage me or, or anything like that, and that pipe's not going to feel resistance. As soon as I pick it up, I always make sure that drag is, is, is firm, not slack. I don't think it's there. Sometimes they grab a bait, they drop a bait. It necessarily every take isn't always a fish. Normally you can feel a knocking, knock, 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 like that when you get it. It's, the pike is there turning that bait round in its mouth because they haven't got hands, so they do it like that, move their tongue and it turns that bait round in their mouth. You should put, strike pretty much instantly as soon as you can feel that take, that braid movement, that knocking, because the hooks are in its mouth, so why not? Why not strike straight away? It's a bit of an old wise tale, tale where people say count to 10, count to 20, things like that. But the only thing you're going to do is get a deep hook pike and that is going to be horrendous if you get that on the, on the bank. You're trying to hook it in the scissors in the side of the mouth and it's the bait's in its mouth, so strike. <laughs> I've never understood the, uh, that old wise tale. I think that's some, when pike used to go to the table, people used to eat them because you wouldn't do that nowadays. But there's, there's no fish there for sure. Put it back in the clip. Could still be there watching. No reason why not. Taste of blood as it hit the bait. 
sometimes doing this I can just encourage it to take No, let me put that one back in. Yeah, that's going. <coughs> Got fish on. Now we've got to bring it in, which is bit of a challenge as it's quite a long way out this rod. Oh, it's nodding away. Let's keep an eye on that drag. It's gone into weed there and it's slowly come out of weed. This time of year you can just keep the pressure on when they go into the weed and it will slowly come through because it will kick its way through. Going into weed again. And there you go, it's kicked its way through the weed again. Again, it shows the importance of strong tackle. That's in weed again. Getting that pressure. that pressure. So the reels I've got here are the FX9, so the Fox FX9s. So they're mini big pit reels. And I use them, I used to use them just for reservoir fishing. I actually now use them for an awful lot of my fishing. And every turn of that handle brings in just under a meter of line. And that gives me real cranking power. And it also means that I can put on 300 meters of the Fox Horizon braid which therefore enables me to cast further. I use a bait boat, I could bait boat further. So it balances with the three and a quarter pound test curve rod really, really well. I don't think this is a huge fish. I think it just had a bit of weed on it to start with, so it felt heavy. And this has got a... But it's a fish, and hopefully bigger than the last one. Yeah, it's still, it's not micro pipe, but it's not big. It's up on the surface now. Bigger than the last one. Let's go and have a look at this one a little bit closer. Okay, so we've got a back in the mat. Have a look where these hooks are. Uh, it was in the mat a little bit there. There we go, open up the mouth. Just look which way they went in, that's the way they'll come out. Nice and safe there for a moment. Have a look at this bait. There's that. There's the bait there. Fox Easy Mat here revolutionised uh, my pike fishing for unhooking fish and keeping them on the mat. Ultimately, that fish, let's move this away. That fish can't slide anywhere, can't flap anywhere. They're absolutely brilliant on hooking mats and they make good seats as well if you're a roving angler and, and, and you're travelling light, but they're absolutely brilliant. They do this size and they, and they do a, a bigger size as well. Um, I use this one for all my pipe fishing and in a boat on the bank, absolutely fantastic. And here, 
A beautiful marked again. Lovely little reservoir pipe. Not a monster, but it just goes to show the effectiveness of uh, popping up the dead baits and giving them a twitch. I've been waiting for a bite. It's a bit quiet. There's a few things you can do with pike fishing when it goes a bit quiet. <coughs> you have to kind of think about what you're going to do and why you're doing it. Then. So I could reel my rods in and I could recast and I could move where they are. I could recast to the same spot because just because I haven't had a pike there, it doesn't mean there's not a pike there. There could well be a pike set out there and just reeling it in, it sees it go away from it and then all of a sudden you cast back at the same spot and a bait comes through to the water. And quite often you can get a pike pretty quickly after that. I've got pop-ups on these baits at the moment because there's quite a bit of weed out there. So my option, what I do, and I don't see a lot of people doing it and it, it really does work. It might work now, it might not, but what I do is I turn the alarm off so I don't get lots of beeping. And that pop-up there, I'm in about 20 foot of water out there and I've got a really buoyant pop-up on. So when I let that go like that, slowly, it takes a while because it has to go through the run ring and everything, but slowly that bait it's just working its way up through the water column. If a pike sat out there and he's watching that bait, he hasn't got a watch on. He doesn't have to come up to your dead bait and he doesn't have to go, oh, there's a dead bait, I've got to eat it quite straight away. He doesn't need to do that. He might quite often learn that he can sit and watch a dead bait all day. That's his dead bait, no one else is getting it. And then when it gets dark or when the light levels change, he picks it up. Or he might learn that night feed him, he never gets caught. So you've got those things to contend with. Whereas when I do this, that's slowly coming up through the water column. And that pike, you thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> it's not dinner time, it's not dark. He might just think, where's that going? So what I do is I do that and I let it pop up. And then I just slowly, slowly do this. I'll be very careful doing it. I'm holding it, finger to thumb like that. I'm not wrapping it around my fingers or anything like that. Because this is braid, this is 50 pound horizon braid. Acts like cheese wire. So it's great for setting hooks. It's great for cutting through the weed. If I was to wrap my fingers around it and I was to get a sudden take of a pike, you could get, could get a nasty cut off that. So I'm just doing, just twitching it and pulling it. A bit like drop shotting, twitching it, wiggling it, just trying to get a take. You don't always get a take straight away with it, sometimes five, ten minutes later, sometimes not at all. But I'm not risking snagging up in any weed. I've got a pop-up bait on, which is what it works best with unless you've got a very clear, hard clay bottom, then you can always twitch the baits back as well, because you don't want to be snagging the trebles into the, into the silt or the weed. And I do it like that. And that's, that's about enough for that rod. I'm slowly just going to pull it back down again. I'm going to set it back up again. And that's that rod done. So this was the long range rod I casted. What I do is I do one very close, do one medium, and then do one far. And um, you can then kind of cut off the lake or the river or wherever you're fishing. Um, and plus, if you tend to pick them all up on one rod, you can put all your rods far or all your rods short, whatever you need to do. So as the fish gets closer, I just ease a few little clicks off on the, uh, on the drag. Because that's ultimately, normally when you use them, lose them, so, so you, uh, you get them in close. And all of a sudden they can surge. And then if you haven't got that drag set, that's when you can put too much pressure on and you can pull the hook. So it's always important to use that drag. Feels like a better fish, but you can never tell if they've got a lot of weed on it this time of year. I can still feel it kicking, but you can never tell for sure. The fish is getting very close now. I'm not bringing it in really, really fast. 
So I don't know how big it is yet. Feels better than the rest, but who knows? Got a bit of weed on it, fishes up on the surface. There we go. Yeah, a bit bigger than the rest. Lovely. There we go, lovely fish there, hooked in the side of the mouth, in the net. Perfect, absolutely perfect. Lovely. That glinting in the sunlight, absolutely beautiful. So, gently pull it over here. Same routine every time. Fish can't get out there because it's trapped underneath the net. Put my foot on the net and it's definitely going nowhere. And then we just need to uh, unclip that. Same routine every time, back in the water. Can't trip over any braid which is lying around or anything like that. And now you can just take care of the fish now. Yeah, it's a, it's a lovely looking fish. Great big head, beautiful. Gonna have a little look at it and um, the result. Twitching the dead baits, staying active with the dead baits. And we've got what we came for, a really nice looking pike, fantastic. Just gonna have a look. There we go then. Beautiful, beautiful pike. Probably an older fish, a bit slim, slim lined. But still, really, really welcome. Definitely a lot bigger. Really nice big head on that fish there. Beautiful, and it just goes to show that twitching those baits and that light level change and being ready can really make all the difference. So, I'm gonna slip this one back. Fingers crossed, there might be another one later this afternoon. Let's see. Here we go then, so I've got a resting in the margins. Point her out into the deeper water. She's kicked a good few times. The gills are going up, but she's kicking again. The gills are going, she's twisting and turning. That's, that's the sign there she goes. Beautiful and strong. That's how you want it. They usually go down, wait at the bottom. That one's gone totally actually, but quite often they'll just wait at the bottom, get their bearings and then off they go. So, great result. Get the rod out as quick as I can, because if there's a feeding window, you don't know that there was just one fish which took your bait. There could have been more fish. You know, I've catapulted out chopped fish and things. There could be more fish out there, not just one. So when you have one fish, don't think, oh yeah, that was great, I had a fish. If you want to catch another one, get your bait out as quick as you possibly can, because there's a chance of getting a bonus fish. You know, that feeding window can be very, very tight. So I'm going to do that straight away. So now moving on to another little thing which I do. Some people love it, some people don't. It works for me. I, it gives me confidence and that's what it's all about. And that is uh, using the impact spot here. And what I'll actually do with it, carp anglers are putting pellet and corn and everything else in it. What I'll actually do, maybe a big chunk, maybe a small bit, and I'll actually put them in there. In here, I've got halibut pellets, I've got oh, so many different types of pellet, and I just soak them in fish oils. And all that does is it gives a totally different breakdown. So the little ones break down really quickly, the bigger ones take longer, it makes my swim active. So basically what that does is that always gives off some sort of oil, some sort of scent. Because if you've got a dead bait out there, it, it, that pike is homing in on just your dead bait. When I'm putting this in the area, that pike is homing in on all these other little bits and those chopped bits, and they've got much, they're over open ends, so there's a lot more scent coming out than this. I'm not talking about spotting and spotting away like you would if you maybe were carp fishing on a big commercial or something like that. Just talking about two or three spots in the rough area just to keep it kind of scented. Um, and as you can see in there, close it down, clip it on, 
and away we go. And I would do that, like I say, at the beginning of the session and after each and every fish as well. And it's definitely caught me a lot more fish. Never can I go fishing without some tools. And you need two tools. You need, first of all, forceps. So these are long nose forceps. I've had these for years. These are years, these are the originals, and they go way back. And, um, and they're still as good as the day as when I bought them. They've still got a really, really good tight grip on them. And this doesn't come as standard. That's just a piece of heavy braid. And uh, I just put some bright beads on there because I'm forever fishing in long grass and, and it can be on dusk and things like that. And the last thing you want to lose is your forceps. I always keep a backup pair just in case, but this is to help me uh, find them in, in long grass. And then we've got cutters. Worst scenario, you've got a deep hook pike. You could accidentally get a hook in your hand for many reasons. These will go through the trebles like a knife through butter. So these are absolutely vital. Oh, this one's going straight away. Is it still going? Is it still going? It look, yep, that's going straight away. So check the drag. That's nice and tight. Is it still going? Yep, that's going away from me. And we lean into it. It's gone solid. And just keep it there, because it was in weed. Don't walk. Ah, oh, we're good. There we go. Good, good head shakes there. Check that drag again now because I've got it out of the weed. Lovely, now we can keep everything nice and smooth. I think the key to playing fish is keeping everything really smooth. If you keep things smooth and keep rhythm, so I can do it when I'm talking because it's just the same, I'm reeling all the way down and just easing back. And then all the way down and easing back. But I'm never getting it, so I'm pointing that rod at that fish. If, if you point the rod at the fish, you've lost your shock absorber. Your shock absorber is your rod. And that is what is enabling you to not put too much pressure onto the fish's mouth. And if you point directly at it, you've got braid on, and you're literally just holding straight on, and that's what can get you, probably not snap-offs, but it will definitely get you hook pulls. So you're just taking it to about one o'clock and reeling it to about 10 o'clock. And that is about the angle you're going to be playing them in on. And yeah, you could get it in a lot quicker if you did lower the rod right down and did pin it all the way back, but you've just got that much higher chance of losing that fish. So I prefer to do short little sweeps with very quick real handles, turn to the real handle. And that's what works for me. Now that fish is getting closer. You've got to keep checking that drag. There we go, so we've got a close in the margins. There we go, she's on the surface. Lovely, whoop, now's the time to check that drag. She's, there she is, okay. head shaking. In she comes, whoop, in she comes. Lovely in that clear water. Now we just get her in the net. That's the one we wanted, fantastic. There she is. Beautiful, that fish. Really nice, hard fighting fish. Picked up a popped up bait. You can probably see we're coming towards the end of the day now. The light levels are changing massively. Probably haven't got long left, but we've had a good day and just shown the importance of using popped up baits when it's weedy, twitching them, the rods, the alarms. 
and then finish in with a lovely fish like this. Absolutely beautiful. So we get this one back. So we've had a good day. Uh, you know, we started the day finding the, finding the right place looking where the grebes were, looking where the cormorants were. They're out there again now, funnily enough, but the light levels are dropping. And uh, within the next 15, 20 minutes, it's probably gonna just be dark. So rather than packing up in the dark, we just had that really nice fish to finish with. And that just goes to show that staying active, working the baits, how to fish those pop-ups over the weeds as well, feeling for those takes, um, all those little things, you know, they all come together and they all help make the difference and put a few more fish on the bank. So I hope that those tips can help you. But we're gonna get going before the light fades and uh, we can't find the car. 